Hello, South Africa. My name is Nazli Sharif and welcome to Straight Talk. Joining me in studio this evening is DA leader John Steenhuizen, and he is here to answer your questions in real time. Make sure you send through your questions, your concerns, and your comments. This town hall will tackle all topics in an effort to open up communication, state the facts, and in some instances, shut down fake news. In the DA, we put great effort in communicating our message and plans to all South Africans and to grow with the people of South Africa. This platform gives us the opportunity to hear you, learn from you, but most importantly, to listen. Please like and share this broadcast. Drop your questions in the comment section on all our social media platforms using the hashtag Straight Talk with John. Let's get straight into it. Welcome, John. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing really well, Nasli, and it's wonderful to be with you uh, in this exciting new year, 2024. Yeah. Yeah. It's an election year, and also really great to be with all of you who are watching on social media, watching at home, and who will be interacting with us this evening. Great to have you with us. John, why did you decide to have a QA? and a Why is it so important to have Q&As like this? Well, look, I think that a lot of... Uh, what politicians say are moderated through the media sources and a variety of other filters. I think it's good for people to be able to engage with their public representatives and politicians one-on-one -on -one and to hear directly from us our views on certain things and, and to be able to put your questions directly, not somebody else's questions, not what somebody else wants to hear, but what you at home would like to find out from me as the leader of the DA, but also about the DA generally and the election in particular. So if you have any questions, please remember, drop it down in our comment section below. If you have a voice note, you want to send us a voice note, our WhatsApp number pops up, please do that. John, our first question, Uncle Teddy, at Uncle Teddy Chef asks, rescue South Africa from what? Well, I think, uh, thank you very much for the question. I, I think it's, it's a good question. And and one which is quite simple to answer, from the terrible fate that awaits us if the current trajectory in our country continues. We live in a country with the highest youth unemployment rates in the world, a country where 42% of our citizens do not have access to jobs and opportunities, a country where young children are dying of malnutrition and hunger across the, the, the length and breadth of South Africa, a place where our electricity is not working, where our the economic infrastructure is crumbling. And if we don't do something now to rescue it from this situation, we're going to be in big trouble. So we've got to be able to focus on keeping our citizens safe. We've got to get citizens into work so people have jobs. We've got to make sure we're providing a good education system. We've got to clean up the corruption that exists at a national level. And we can only do that if we can get into office. And that's why we're calling on South African citizens across the board to make sure that they're registered to vote. It's the last registration weekend mm -hmm. coming up this weekend, mm -hmm. 3rd and 4th of February, mm -hmm. where you'll be able to have the last opportunity to go to your voting station and register. The reality is in any democracy, before we can rescue anything, we need a team of people who are ready to get the job done. And you get ready to get the job done by making sure that you're registered to vote. If you're not registered to vote, your voice is not heard in a democracy. You can go immediately now while we're online to check.da.org.za and check your registration status right now. And if you're not registered, it'll literally take you five minutes. So do it while this is going on. You're on your computer already. Get your ID card ready. Make sure you're registered. The power in this next election to rescue our country, Teddy, is going to lie with those who are registered. And let me tell you, this election, there's just too much at stake to stay at home. Every vote is going to make a difference. Absolutely. And remember, the new law says that you can only register where you live. So please make sure you double, triple check your registration status. John, at Mandisa underscore F asks, what is the DA's position on illegal immigrants? Yeah, well, I think that uh, any country in the world would be concerned about having large numbers of undocumented immigrants in them. In fact, 
Uh, there are very few countries in the world that have as porous borders as South Africa. And so it's not an ideal situation. Uh, we need to be able to know who's in South Africa, why are they here, and whether they're here legally or not. And that can only happen if we have an effective and functioning home affairs system. Right now, home affairs system is in such a mess that it's virtually impossible for even ordinary South Africans to access simple services like passports, birth certificates, uh, identity documents, etc. Long queues, long waits, generally inefficient. So what we need to do is to move to a system where we have secure borders. Our borders have collapsed thanks to the withdrawal of the SANDF and uh, from, the, from those borders where people can just walk across them. But we also have to have a home affairs system that can process those who are genuinely seeking immigration. So as I see the solution, it's a two-tier solution. On the one hand, you want to encourage skilled immigration into the country. Skilled immigrants bring with them opportunities, they set up factories, they bring expertise that can be passed on to locals. What you don't want is large numbers of unskilled immigrants crossing over. But you need to have a proper system to process who is coming into the country. Uh, we should be able to at the touch of a button know who is here, why they're here, and what they're doing here. So you need to have a system that's open and encourages people to be legal. At, at the moment, the bureaucracy and high degrees of corruption that we see taking place uh, at home affairs centers where people are seeking refugee status, genuinely fleeing conflicts in their countries, genuinely fleeing awful situations, are not incentivized to become legal because they get put through a, a, a personal hell mm -hmm. in just trying to get the paperwork done and, of course, become victims of those who are seeking to corrupt and take advantage of their situation. Um, so it's a balance. You've got to make sure strong borders. You've got to make sure that you have a strong home affairs system and we've got to have an encouraging, opening, welcome door to skilled immigration so that we can get those essential skills that we need in the country to help grow the economy and to transfer to our South African citizens. John, we've gotten a lot of questions around economy, the DA's plan for jobs, and one of those is Mike Lima, and he asks, what is your economic plan? Yeah. Well, thanks, Mike, uh, and thanks for the question. I'm very excited that in the next uh, two to three weeks, we'll be unveiling a brand new economic policy in the DA, and that will supplement our economic justice policy, which was released during the uh, first part of last year, which focus on how we can uplift more people out of poverty and into opportunity, and the measures that we would use to be able to make sure that there is targeted relief, particularly for those who've been previously disadvantaged, while at the same time cutting out the abuse by the elite that we've seen taking place. Mm -hmm. But what our economic policy is going to do is set out very, very clearly how we believe we can get our economy growing. Remember, a growing economy is like the rising tide that lifts all boats. If we want to lift people out of poverty into opportunity, if we want to lift people out of social welfare into viable jobs so they can build a better future for themselves and their families, we need jobs and we need lots of them. Mm. And jobs are only going to come if we get the macro infrastructure that are, is required for an economy to work um, Top, uh, top draw uh, economic infrastructure, making sure that we're focusing on growing the economy, attracting investment. And I'm very excited about some of the key interventions. We see huge opportunities, for instance, in breaking up state monopolies and opening up greenfield industries, unleashing entrepreneurs, unleashing small businesses and micro enterprises from the current strangulation that they have from red tape. I've been dealing with lots of small business people who complain bitterly that they're under significant pressure all the time from government for this form, that form, that compliance. They're being harassed by certain uh, inspectors, all because government wants to get some money out of them. If we can free them up, as our economic policy will seek to do, to get out there and focus on one thing and one thing only, growing their business. Because when their business grows, they create jobs, and when those jobs are created, more people are given an opportunity. And I'm really excited about this and I hope everyone's going to be watching the space. Um, there's been a lot of work done in it. We've brought in some incredible economic experts that have been advising us on it. Uh, there's been some great ideas from the public as well. And we are really excited about this economic policy because it's going to be a complete game changer for how we get South Africa off this low growth, high debt, high unemployment trajectory and onto a new trajectory of hope 
prosperity and opportunity for far more South Africans. John, would you agree with me when we say that poor governance, corruption, cadre deployment is exactly what's holding this country behind and taking jobs away from those who actually need it? Yes, and um, these are all significant drags and constraints on the economy. Look, they're by no means the only ones, but they are self-harm. They do incredible damage to our ability to be able to uh, roll out decent services, to be able to make sure that the people who need government services the most get them. A lot of people think that corruption, maladministration, and cadre deployment are victimless crimes. Well, they're not victimless crimes because the, the real victims of corruption, maladministration, cadre deployment and the like are poor South Africans because every cent of public money that finds its way into some politician's back pocket or into some cadre network where people are letting other people use their own houses and then getting government contracts, etc. Every cent that goes that way is one cent that's not being spent on the people. It's one cent that's not going towards building a school, building a clinic, hiring more nurses and doctors for our public hospitals, making sure that we're building bridges and roads and fixing our ports so we can grow our economy. So every, every cent of money that's stolen uh, is an opportunity cost that's lost to citizens. And far too much of the money in our country is already spent on the politicians and not on the people. We can fundamentally change that in our NK to deployment bill, our reintroduction of the Scorpions proposal, are all designed to make sure that the corrupt and inept and the cadres are not sitting around the table making decisions. They're sitting in jail where they belong. Thank you, everybody, so much for sending through your questions. We really appreciate it. And your voice notes, John. We have our first voice note from Noziwe. Let's give it a listen. Hi, John. My name is Nozizwe from Pumalanga in Bombela. My question is, how are you going to create jobs for the youth and recent graduates? People are starving and they are in need of change. Yeah, thanks, uh, Nozizwe. And it's a really important question. I mean, one of the hardest parts uh, for me traveling around South Africa is traveling past intersections and seeing young graduates in their gowns holding the degree certificates just desperate for work. They've got their qualification, but because our economy is not growing and because the government has got job-killing policies in place, they can't find work and it's heartbreaking to see. But it also is a spur to me to be able to do more to ensure that we rescue the economy. Now, there are a number of things we can do, but it's got to focus on stimulating job creation. And whether you like it or not, the public sector does not create jobs. The jobs that we see in the public sector uh, EPWP are well and good, but they are often for very small periods and they don't provide lasting stability for people to be able to build a future on. So we need real jobs for more people. We live in a country with the highest youth unemployment rates in the world. And it's not by accident. It's through the repeated self-harm that's done to the South African economy by a government that long ago stopped caring about the people and only cares about itself. Um, and so you have these insider networks we think about breaking these up, breaking the control of the state, giving more opportunity for new entrants into markets like electricity, uh, logistics, transport, can start to open up parts of the industry. And also by adopting a investor and business friendly framework in South Africa. Not treating business and industry as the enemy, but rather treating them as partners in the jobs and growth agenda. And the great thing, um, that I can say is that I don't have to promise you, uh, you know, theories and things on paper. I can show you what we've been able to do with these approaches. The DA run Western Cape uh, created over 300,000 new jobs uh, last year alone, precisely because these are the policies being applied there. We attract investment. We work in public-private partnerships. We make sure that we run good, clean, accountable government that spends money on ensuring the economy grows, not on making sure that the politicians' pockets grow. 71% of all citizens in the Western Cape are salary earners, which shows you that there are real jobs being created here, and that's why more and more people come to the Western Cape to look for opportunity. We want to do that, not only in the Western Cape, but we also want to do it in Pumalanga, where, where um, Nozi lives, and to make sure 
that we can roll out the jobs there in big numbers. We can rescue South Africa. We can do what we've done in the Western Cape on a national scale, but it's going to require a new government to do that because we've seen that the ANC cannot let go of their job-killing policies. They can't let go of the state monopolies like Eskom, which are keeping the lights off and our factories closed. They cannot let go of the ports and harbors that they run so inefficiently. And they cannot let go of Transnet. Just today, just today, uh, the IMF downgraded South Africa's investment outlook by almost a full percent, precisely because of what they say are constraints through government monopolies on the ports and on Transnet. We've got to get government out of the way. They must focus on doing what government does and, and do it well, but unleash the power of the private sector because that's how you create jobs and that's how we make sure that our young graduates mm -hmm. get into work and can build a better future for themselves. Mm -hmm. John Gregory Taylor says, the situation in South Africa is thoroughly depressing, especially with the arrogant and greedy ANC in power. How can we change this hellish nightmare which never seems to end? Well, I've got some good news. Don't be depressed. Uh, there's very exciting uh, times for us in South Africa. This election uh, will be the first time in 30 years where no single party will get its own majority and you know, the ANC will, will potentially not win. We know that in the last 30 years, everyone said, well, the ANC is going to win just by how much are they going to win. This election, all bets are off, which means that the door is wide open now for a new majority to be built. And that's precisely why um, I announced in April of last year what I then called the Moonshot Pact, bringing opposition parties together to work together towards a common objective of being able to form a new government so that we can build a new majority and do, a better, do better for South Africans. That then transformed, and it's now the multi-party charter, there are now 11 parties that are part of that charter. And I see the DA's role in that as being a sort of anchor, being able to be able to bring the DA's experience in government, being able to bring our policies and tried and tested initiatives to the table within the charter and be able to help get us over the finish line. So the ANC can be beaten, and that is the thing that should excite us. It shouldn't depress us. There's lots to be excited about. But it's all going to come down to what I said earlier. It's going to come down to whether you are registered to vote and that you come out on election day. There's lots of people who say, oh, well, I'm not interested in politics. There are 13 million people who are registered to vote who didn't come out and vote in the last election. There are further 14 million people who just didn't register at all, despite being of registration age. Now, think about this for a second. If just 10% of those people register and come out and vote, we will be able to have a majority, a new government, done and dusted after May. You will have a new majority in the country. We can vote the ANC out. We can bring in a new government. And so I'm really calling on people to be excited about the future. We can rescue the country. It's now within our grasp. But you've got to be registered and you've got to vote. Don't say I'm not interested in politics because let me tell you, you may not be interested in politics, but it is very interested in you. It's reached into your home and it's switched off your lights. It's reaching into your taps and switching them off in your homes. It's killing jobs. All that can be traced back to bad political decisions. If we want to fix the country, we've got to fix the politics first. And fixing the politics starts with you. John, uh, there's a lot of engagement happening on social media right now around this Q&A. Keep sending in your questions, sending in your comments, sending in your voice notes. John is here ready to answer your questions. John at Ruach says, thanks for hosting this platform. My question is, what is devolution of power? Is it not the same as independence? Mm. Well, thanks. That's a, that's a very good question. And um, I see that the ANC are desperately trying in the Western Cape to try and conflate the two. The two very different concepts. Uh, independence is a concept all on its own. What devolution is it's, about, is, it's about actually devolving power away from the center down to provincial and local government, giving provinces more power and competent local municipalities more power to be able to perform functions that are better performed at those levels. Now, we've seen at a macro level and at a national level that when you try and have national uh, monopolies and national plans 
and then try and, and hammer them into different provinces, it doesn't work. Policing is a failure. 75 citizens murdered every single day. Gender-based violence figures are growing up. They're not going down. And as a father of, of, of three young girls and the only male in my family, this is a huge source of concern for me. I worry about the safety of my three girls, uh, just like you worry about your children. Our ports and harbors are not, uh, are not working, that they are hampering our economy, precisely because you've got a national monopoly. Our rail service has failed almost completely because you have a national monopoly. What devolution seeks to do is to take those powers that are being badly used by a centralized government and devolve them down where it makes better sense to be able to allow them to be run more efficiently and effectively, closer to the people in a more coherent way. And this is how it works in most successful countries around the world. Very few countries in the world where you have a national police service, for instance, that's responsible for policing every community from a central level. What you have is a federal police structure with certain federal imperatives, but policing is done by states, provinces, local municipalities, because they are closer to the ground. When you devolve power closer to the ground, it ensures that you're able to ensure greater transparency and accountability, better feedback loops, much more efficient feedback loops between the local community and like. And again, Rock, I don't need to, um, I don't even need to, you know, to again, put theory in front of you. I can show you practical examples. The DA's LEAP program in the Western Cape, partnership between the city of Cape Town and the province, not willing to sit back and watch the failure of the national SAPS in the Western Cape drive up crime numbers, stepped in to do something. And the local um, the LEAP program has had an incredible impact, putting over a thousand police officers on the street to fight crime. Priority crime down 14% year on year in the last stats. A thousand arrests over the December period by these police officers. And these are properly trained, properly equipped, and properly accredited police officers with full policing powers. They're not vigilantes or, you know, some, or wardens as, as some other uh, people have tried to do. These are the real deal and they can get out on the ground and fight crime on a daily basis. And are the prime example about why we should be doing the same for electricity, ports and harbors, transport, uh, public transport, rail transport, uh, and so many other aspects where provinces and local government will be able to perform the functions so much better. That is devolution, and as I say, viva la devolution. John, what happens and what, what do we do if powers don't get evolved? What then? Well, I think it's going to be a problem because we're going to continue to see the same old failures taking place. There's a reason why our crime rate has not got better over the last 25 years. There's a reason why our ports are now amongst the lowest in the world. It's because they are stuck in this state control from the center. So my worry is that if we continue down this path, we're going to see things getting worse and not better. And that's why we've got to fight really hard for this devolution. But I also fundamentally believe that there are going to be some huge changes after this election. Provinces like KwaZulu-Natal, Gauteng, potentially the Free State, are going to be falling under different governments. And I think that those governments should be able to have the power then to be able to change the lives of the citizens that have voted for them, to be able to do something different to what's been done before, and to bring a plurality of thought to the ideas and uh, idea table and, and the solutions table through different ways of doing things. And I think we should be encouraging that. If we continue down the same old path, there's a saying, if you keep doing the same old thing, you're always going to get the same old results. It's time for us to do something different. Our constitution provides for devolution. We mustn't be fooled by all these red herrings that Becky Taylor and others try to push out about why it can't happen. The Constitution's framers were clear. The powers from national can be devolved to competent provincial and other governments um, through a very simple process provided for in the Constitution. We don't need to change it. We just need to use the existing powers that are there and really show South Africans that local is lacquer and that you get better results when you have the power concentrated away from the centre and down closer to the people. 
John, I'm seeing comments uh, from somebody called Ed Sham <laughs> that is saying that, you know, we're not getting questions. Uh, it's all pre-selected. Ed, bro, send through your questions. We'll get there. We'll get to it. There's a lot of questions we have to go through. So be patient. And if your question is not answered, then maybe at the next section. But while we wait for your question, Ed, let's move on to Peter Carswell. And Peter Carswell says, after the euphoria of a coalition win has passed, what are the first things that you want to achieve in government? Yeah, I think it's a very, very good question. I can't wait for Ed Sham's question to, to come through. Um, to say that um, one of the reasons why Sir Ramaphosa's promises never materialised, and remember the new dawn, we were promised bullet trains and a new beefed up NPA that was going to move swiftly to prosecute the corrupt, we were going to have smart cities, we were going to have a smaller government, we were going to have a zero tolerance for corruption in government. Why none of that ever actually materialised because he didn't bring a legislative agenda to Parliament. And I'm very proud of the DA as a party. We are really sitting down looking at the types of legislation we would like to see happening in that first year of a new government that we hope to be a key and significant player in. Um, and these include things like the end cater deployment bill, which is currently before Parliament, that will end cater deployment for any party, whether it's the DA, uh, the IFP, the EFF, whoever's in charge, will end cater deployment and start building a professional public service that services the people and their needs and not party needs, and that can serve any government that's in power. Mm -hmm. The second one would be to combat corruption by reintroducing the Scorpions, and Glynis Breitenbach has already drafted a great bill which we call Scorpions 2.0, which would see the reintroduction of a multidisciplinary crime-fighting force that can go hard after the politicians and the corrupt. The only reason the first Scorpions were closed down is because they started to get too close to the corrupt and had a 95% conviction rate. We want to bring that back and make sure that it can get done. And then thirdly, to start breaking state monopolies up so that we can break the stranglehold on our economy that's holding us back, that's making sure that our ports are inefficient, that's making sure that our people can't find work, that are making sure that people feel unsafe in their homes, and to start devolving those powers and breaking up those monopolies um, and obviously working on how we can keep people safe in their homes. All of these things together, we believe, would send a very clear signal to international and local investors that this is a new government that's serious about tackling corruption, that's serious about building a new economy that's going to um, be a, a good investor environment, that cer creates certainty around what we want to achieve. And I think that uh, within that first year, these key pieces of legislation would, would be almost essential to rekindle the confidence of the people that finally they've got a government that's working for them and not against them. John, Miriam at Bertha Miriam says, a major concern for her is the coalition talks with the ANC. Is this true? <laughs> uh, no, this is what you, you would call classic fake news. Um, there's no coalition talks with the ANC. I've been very, very clear since April last year that my focus as the leader of the DA and certainly the focus of our party is on getting the multi-party charter over the 50% plus one mark so that we can form a new majority. That is the focus. It's what I get up every morning and focus on doing, on making sure people are registered so they come out and vote in greater numbers, on telling people why their vote is important and encouraging them to make sure that they help our 11 party uh, multi-party charter get over the finish line in the next election because the reality is nothing is going to change and the multi-party charter represents South Africa's very best shot at an alternative government. You may think that there's these other little parties that you know you might like how the leader looks on TV or they might have a nice manifesto or maybe their poster is really cool but the reality is if you don't have a pathway to victory all of those things are nice to have but they'll be gone after the election. If you want to see change, if you want to see good, honest people in government, you've got to look very carefully at the path to victory. And right now, the multi-party charter is the most certain path to victory, and the DA remains a core foundational presence within that multi-party charter, and we hope to form that after the, after the next elections as well. So I think it is absolutely essential that these things 
are the key focus going forward. I also think that we've had a lot of coalition experience over the last five to 10 years, and I believe that we've learned a lot of lessons from coalitions, and I'm convinced that we can make this work, which is also why the multi-party charter was set up so far in advance. I said in April last year, let's start now so we can iron out all the differences, that we can get our ducks in a row, that we can make sure we're prepared. So after the election in that 14-day period where you have to elect a president and you've got to start putting a government together, we already know what we need to do. We are certain about the pathway and we know what needs to be done. And I'm very proud of not only the DA, but also our, 11, uh, our 10 other partners in the multi-party charter who are working very, very hard to build a new future for all South Africans. Charles, let's get into it. I want to speak a little bit more about fake news. The DA seems to be a victim of fake news more often than not. It's so frustrating because I don't know which is worse. People having so much time on their hands to make fake news or the fact that people actually believe it. Mm. How do we challenge this? How, how do people get real facts from the DA and not always being listened or blinded by this yeah. fake news? Well, I, I think it comes down to being able to discern for yourself what's fake and what's not. And it's very tough these days because social media, um, AI, all of these things make it a lot easier for people to put together things that may look real but are not, be, not born out of the facts. And that's why we've taken such a hard line against fake news. Where we find fake news, we have go out, so we've already I have laid criminal charges against a number of individuals for spreading fake news. But ask yourself really the first thing is, is this believable? There was, for instance, uh, this ridiculous story during the rounds that I had sold the Western Cape to Jeff Bezos. Crazy. And it's, I mean, it's absolutely beyond, you know, beyond the pale. And I mean, why on earth would I even be able to sell the Western Cape to Jeff Bezos? Uh, I don't have those powers. Um, and, and why would I in the first place? But it, it's clearly designed to drive confusion and the like amongst voters. So be very careful out there to discern before you just simply share something blindly on social media. Ask yourself the question, is this believable? Check it out and ensure that it is, uh, it is real news. Fake tweets are the new one, you know, people using fake accounts that look like the individual's account, but there's a letter different in the name with some outrageous comment made on it. Check it out before you share it because you could end up like uh, the gentleman from Richards Bay uh, who's now facing very, very serious charges for sharing stuff that was real fake news on social media. Yeah. Please remember, don't forget your voice notes. John, we've got our next voice note from Stephanie. Hi, John. Um, my name is Stephanie from the West of the Cape. Um, just a question from me. There is confusion and miscommunication around the DA stance on the situation in the Middle East. Can you please clarify the DA stance on this matter? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Stephanie. And, and thanks for the question. Let me start by saying that um, I obviously mourn the loss of life uh, in the Middle East in this conflict. It's terrible to see the scenes that we've seen of women and children and families uh, torn apart, um, destroyed, displaced, and it, it, my heart really goes out to, to all those affected in the Middle East. Let me be very clear, the Democratic Alliance believes in a two-state solution. We believe in a secure Israel living alongside a sovereign and unoccupied Palestine. We believe that the two need, can, need, and, and must live in mutual coexistence. We believe that a pathway to peace needs to be found urgently and that both sides need to come to the table to be able to start building that pathway. Unless we move swiftly to a two-state solution, we are going to end up with ongoing conflict in the region. I fundamentally believe that in order for peace to prevail, both sides need to show maturity and leadership and come to the table. Now, I get asked the question all the time, but are you, are you on Israel's side? Are you on Palestine's side? Whose side are you on? And my answer is simple. We are on the side of peace. We want peace in the Middle East, and we need to move towards a lasting solution. We're also a party that believes fundamentally in the rule of law. In fact, it's a foundational principle of our party. And the rule of law extends to international law. The International Court of Justice has made its ruling, and we're calling on 
all of those who are affected by it to abide by the International Court of Justice's ruling and ensure that it is implemented to the letter. But I reiterate, we fundamentally believe that there can be lasting peace in the Middle East, but it requires a sovereign and occupied Palestine next to a secure Israel. John, I'm really enjoying these voice notes. Mm -hmm. So I think let's do another voice note from Mzotolo. Hi, this is Mzotolo Ngala from Melibode. I just have one question. Uh, my question is, what do you have to say to those people who believe the DA is a white party? I'm asking this because a number of black leaders have left the organization. <laughs> Well, thanks very much uh, for that. Look, firstly, let me say uh, to all the viewers that uh, it's the silly season now in politics. We're a couple of months away from an election and you're going to see a lot of jumping around between parties. People realizing they're not electable in this party, so they jump to another party. Uh, new parties are being formed and people are going to join them. Uh, people are jumping back to parties they used to belong to. It's kind of like the transfer season in football where you start to see this flurry of moving around. So it's going to happen a lot. But let me just say... This, if I may. Uh, the Democratic Alliance is not a white party. Yes, we've got white members, um, but we're not a white party. We've got white activists, we're not a white party. We've got black members and black activists, but we're not a black party. We've got colored and Indian public representatives, activists and voters, but we're not a colored and Indian party. We're a party for all South Africans. And that is why our focus is on values, on principles, and a shared agenda for the country. And we're providing a home for all South Africans. And here's the thing, it's working. If you look at the DA's voter breakdown, and some very interesting research was done last year, not by us, but by the Social Research Foundation. And they showed very clearly that while other parties only pull votes from particular race groups, the DA pulls its votes in roughly thirds. One third black voters, one third white voters, and one third colored voters with a small group of Indian uh, voters uh, in, included in that. That shows that the DA's diversity is able to pull votes from all communities. I would also like to say that the DA's leadership is the most diverse in the country. If you look at the top six of the parties to the left and right of the DA, they're all monochromatic. They're all people of the same color, in some cases, the same gender. In the DA, you have women and, uh, women and men, you've got uh, Black, white, Indian, colored, all represented there. But here's the other thing. I'm a white South African, but you don't have to be a black South African to stand up for oppressed black marginalized South Africans. I can do that just as well. Just as you don't need to be a woman to be able to stand up against gender-based violence. Men should be taking up the fight against gender-based violence as well. And yes, I may come from a minority group in South Africa, but that doesn't diminish the contribution that I and others can make just because of the color of our skin. We don't see people in the DA as envoys of their race. We see people as individuals and we judge them on the contribution that they can make. Imagine if America had told Barack Obama that he couldn't be president because he is from a minority group or that Rishi Sunak couldn't be prime minister because he accounts from a, a, a racial group that only accounts for around 7% of the UK population. It would be outrageous. So I would ask South Africans to look at each other as fellow South Africans, as people, and, and judge each other on our contributions and what we are able to achieve. And I want to tell you, if you're black, marginalized, downtrodden, and excluded, believe you me, you've got no better person fighting your corner than me, and those of us in the DA. And we won't stop until you're put onto a path to opportunity and that your life improves. John, sometimes, you know, when people speak about this, when they say the DA is the most diverse party, it's almost like they malfunction because they can't wrap their head around what diversity actually looks like. Yeah. And I, this is my question. In Parliament, you are surrounded, <laughs> the, the top leadership of the DA in mm. Parliament, Tell us, how does it look? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I, I'm the only male there. I mean, that's the, that's, that is the reality. So um, the chief whip in parliament, Saviwa Gahube, is a black female. Uh, our caucus chair uh, is, is uh, Desiree Fanavolt, who's a female. 
Anli Lotri, Deputy Chief Whip, and Bridget Masango, the Deputy Chair, uh, my parliamentary councillors. All, all of these people are women, and they are yeah. able to ensure that uh, we have a good gender representation yeah. there, and they also make sure that I'm kept in line as well, which uh, is a good thing. <laughs> Decisive leadership <laughs> <Indeed>. right there. <laughs> John, uh, let's move on. Dorothy says, people with disabilities, that's what she wants us to speak about. What is the DA's position on building an inclusive society? I think that uh, it's a very important question and I, I don't think we do enough in South Africa to mainstream um, those who are differently abled. And I think there are a number of things that governments could be doing and I'm proud of the governments in the Western Cape, for instance, which has got a number of programs from uh, specially designed uh, public transport systems, uh, pr creating opportunities and call centres and other areas for people who are differently abled to be able to find work and be productive members of society and be treated like they want to be treated as ordinary members of our society. And I think there's a lot more that we can be doing. It really pains me to see public buildings that still remain inaccessible for uh, people who are differently abled. Um, to look at some of the laws which make it very difficult for people, for instance, to bring uh, guide dogs into uh, certain places uh, and to travel with them. Um, and I think that we need to be doing a lot, lot more to, to mainstream um, people who are differently abled and ensure that they can live a quality life, uh, not on the periphery, but at the very center of South African life. And that's going to require legislation and it's going to require a determination from government, not just talking, determination to change things and get things done. And I think it's a challenge for political parties as well mm -hmm. to make sure that you actively include uh, differently able people as public representatives um, in your various councils, uh, in parliaments, etc., so that it really can be a case of nothing about us without us. Yeah. Johnny Hall, 38. John, Johnny Hall, 38, says, mm -hmm. what is the DA's policy on land reform? DA's policy on land reform, that's also a really good question. <laughs> um, and I think that the current uh, situation with uh, land reform is a disaster in South Africa. I don't think that anybody uh, who is you know, of sound mind can accept that we don't have a skewed land ownership uh, dynamic in South Africa. And I don't think anybody can argue that there has not been legislative dispossession of land. All the way back to the Gray, Glenn Gray Act, the Pegging Act, the Group Areas Act, there's been systematic legislative dispossession of land and it needs to be addressed. But the DA's policy is on giving land to people. We don't believe the state should own land. We believe that land should be given to people and that the low hanging fruit, if we want to see changes in the land ownership patterns in South Africa, has got to be state owned land. And that's why uh, the DA took uh, the case of David Rechatze all the way to the highest court to make sure that he was given the land that was due to him and that be promised to him. And we're using David Rechatz's case now as the, uh, as, as the precedent for fighting more and more of them to ensure that, that people who have been promised land don't remain vassals of the state for the rest of their life. They don't remain in servitude to the state, but they actually own the properties that they are on. It's also why we've gone to the Human Rights Commission to highlight the fact that in rural areas across the country, Many people do not own the land that they live and work on and that um, they are not able to use land as a productive asset to be able to leverage against capital, to be able to improve that land because they've got no security of tenure. And our complaint at the Human Rights Commission makes the point that why should these people live in a constitutional twilight zone uh, be just because they happen to live in rural areas when the very rights that should be vested in them in terms of the constitution are provided to everybody else. Finally, I would say that the real hunger for land in South Africa is not in rural areas. The real hunger for land is in the urban and peri-urban areas, where people want to access services, opportunities, education for their children, and health care. And that's why the key to really changing things there is through unlocking state-owned land that is well located. And this is precisely what lies behind the DA's programs in the Western Cape, and particularly the city of Cape Town. Uh, and by way of example, the Conradi Park um, housing development, which is located in Pinelands, very close to the urban centre, uh, where we've built mixed-use development so that people live, work and play, that you have the, uh, the commercial side subsidising the, uh, the housing side, so that you've got social housing there, but you've also got 
aspirational housing that moves towards bond ownership and the like. And I'm very proud of these projects. And that is where the key to resolving the injustice, particularly as it relates in urban land, is on unlocking those parcels of land uh, that are well located and bringing people closer to the urban edge so that they have better access to economic opportunities and are able to really um, you know, find places to, to live and to own those properties. It's no use expropriating land and then you know, allowing the state to continue to own it. We've already seen the state cannot even distribute state-owned land. Why would we give it more? Let's give the people the land that they live and work on, let's give them title so they have an asset that can make sure that they go forward. My last point on this, if I may, is that the high-level panel report showed very clearly that the national government's budget for land reform has seldom gone over 2% of, um, you know, of the total budget. And I think that is a shame. I think more needs to be spent on effective land reform. Uh, government's got to put its money where its mouth is. And we've got to eliminate corruption in the sector. It's not acceptable that the Guptas got land that was meant for landowner mm. beneficiaries in Freda because of a corrupt connection. We need to combat corruption and we need to make sure that we give the people the land. Chad, we have so many questions that keep coming in, and I really want us to get through as many questions as possible. So I say this from a point of coming from love. Can we shorten it? Okay. Please, just so that we can. Well, get I, you know, you give a politician an, you know, an, uh, a platform. This is going to happen. No, I understand, <laughs> but we want to get through as many questions as we can, and let's jump straight back at Grove underscore Coos. Forgive me, Twane went in a downward cycle under DA leadership. Mm. How is the DA going to prevent a recurrence leading government? Beyond the Western Cape, everything the DA touches is not turning into gold. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't think that's a fair assessment because if you look at other municipalities out there, uh, Midval is by far the best run municipality in Gauteng. It won municipality of the year last year. Really excellent under Mayor Texera. Uh, Umgeni municipality in KwaZulu-Natal under Chris Papas doing really well. Chwane is a, is, a, is a problem area because we're in a coalition there. It's a eight-party coalition and it makes it a lot more difficult to turn things around when, you know, Chris and, and Peter, Tex Peter Texera have got their hand on the steering wheel, they've got a DA majority and they've, they've moved determinately there. When you've got eight hands on the steering wheel, it does complicate things. But what's complicated uh, Chwane even more is the fact that you know, the DA was not strengthened enough there to be able to form that anchor, to be able to uh, really get things done and, and hold the course there. And it, it's been in a really terrible state. But also, we must also accept that it's over 30 years of poor government there. Now, I'm not you know, seeking to, to push the blame. I'm just, there is a historical context to Chwane's current uh, problems. Um, but also, the municipality was starting to come right and then was unlawfully put under administration by the province. And we went to court and it took us a year to get that illegal action overturned. And when we came back to office, all of the money that had been built up, the reserves, the stabilization of the finance had been undone, the looting had continued, and Chwane was in a worse financial situation. I have huge faith in Mayor Celia's Brink. I think he is an excellent mayor. I think he's got some good partners there in the city of Chwane. And I'm very, very confident that they are working to turn it around. It's going to take a little bit of time, but I think that the recent courage that Celia's Brink showed by standing up to the unions and refusing to bow the knee to violence when people make unreasonable demands is a good sign of a municipality that's on the up. But here's the thing. If we want stable coalitions, we've got to make sure that we ensure they've got strong anchors that can get things done. Joburg is a very good example. Uh, 18 parties on the Joburg Council, 11 of the 18 parties have less than 1% of the vote. It's impossible to form a stable coalition there because the tail is always going to try and wag the dog. And that is the, what, the, what the voters showed up. And that's why we're calling for a re-election in Joburg so that the voters have another opportunity to, again, look at how they resolve those problems there. Uh, and so you want, a, you want a coalition to work I believe we can make it work. It just requires strong anchors and partners that are willing to 
uh, really share the values and principles to get things done. I think we're getting that right in the multi-party charter. Mm. And I think that we're ironing out a lot of the problems up front before we get to uh, the, any form of coalition after the election, which I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. To everybody at home, remember, send through your voice notes. The WhatsApp number keeps popping up on screen. And we have another voice note by Mike. John, let's hear what Mike has to say. Hi, John. Uh, my question is about Cape independence. Uh, can it even happen? And do you think it's a good thing? Well, thanks very much for the question, Mike. Um, I just don't think it's a realistic prospect uh, at this stage. And I look where the low-hanging fruit lies for us as, uh, as a party in the Western Cape, and that is through devolution. Uh, you can talk about independence all you like. Uh, Scotland's been talking about it for over 100 years. Uh, Catalonia has been talking about it for just as long. Quebec and Canada has been talking about it for just as long. And we can have those existential debates and, and, and say, well, it's, independence is better than this or, or the next thing. The reality is, and the real politic is, is that the low-hanging fruit lies with devolution. It is within our reach. It's already constitutionally prescribed. And I believe that's where our efforts, energy, and focus should be. And I think we can have some quick wins with that. And that is why our focus is on that. And that is what the Western Cape Powers Bill is, is seeking to do. It's seeking to entrench the powers and channels that already exist in the Constitution to give provinces more power. I also believe that the argument of some in, you know, that, that favor the independence route um, have become moot. One of the arguments always was, oh, well, the DA is never going to win at a national level, so let's secede or let's have our own independent place. The reality is now that with the multi-party charter, we have a clear pathway to victory. The parties in the charter, around 36% of the national vote, that's just 16% shy of a majority. And just think, as I said earlier, 10% of the 27 million join the multi-party charter and vote for, uh, vote for parties in the multi-party charter, we're over the finish line. Um, I don't believe in factions and fractions. I believe in uniting and leading the whole. And I want to rescue the whole of South Africa because I fundamentally believe that we are better together and that our country can reach new heights and we can do it, but we can only do it with a new government at a national level. And we can only do that if you at home are registered to vote. Go to check.da.org and check your registration status. This is the only way that we can make sure that the multi-party charter comes into government and we have a good DA majority in provinces so that we can actually bring change. John, our next question is from Jules Rowlett. And Jules Rowlett says, what can be done about BEE? I want to come home and I'm not sure how to get a job. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I, I think that uh, the, the wide consensus now is that BE has failed. Uh, black households are 10% poorer now than they were under, under BEE um, since, since it began. Black unemployment has increased, it hasn't, dis, uh, hasn't decreased. And inequality in South Africa has widened, it hasn't narrowed. So clearly the policies haven't worked and we need to do something different. You know, the, the heart of insanity is doing the same thing over again, expecting a different result. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what government tries to do all the time. So what we're gonna focus on is genuine empowerment. How do we genuinely empower the large majority of people in South Africa who are locked out of opportunity and trapped in poverty? 32 million of them, 99.97% of them are black South Africans. And I believe you do it by focusing on poverty, focusing your policies on, on uplifting people out of, po out of poverty and using poverty as the means to decide who gets empowerment. Under triple B, double E and B, E, E, you've had a very small group of people becoming incredibly wealthy. I and mean, we've seen the revelations of Paul Mashatile's blesser, uh, in, the, in the last few days, uh, unfolding in News 24 and the like. And, you know, we're calling on the president to sack the deputy president because clearly he's in the pocket of some very well-connected people who've done very well out of BEE and government contracts. But it has not helped the majority of poor black South Africans who remain marginalized, unemployed, uh, without uh, people fighting their corner. And I think that that's wrong. So our focus would be on using poverty as a means in South Africa 
to measure disadvantage. What you would do by that is focus your empowerment policies on the people who need it the most, the 32 million people who are poor, 99.7% of whom are black, and you would cut out the BE fat cats because uh, they wouldn't qualify um, to keep on being empowered through these government-connected contracts because they wouldn't meet the means test. And it's not a revolutionary uh, policy. It's the same policy that's used for the SASA grant system. They look at your means. Do you qualify? It doesn't matter your race. Do you qualify for this particular uh, pension based on your means? Same with NISFIS. Do you qualify according to the means test? Housing allocation, is it done, it's done according to your means test. Um, do you qualify? And if you qualify, you get the empowerment. I believe that is a way to genuinely empower the, the millions of South Africans who remain trapped in poverty. I also fundamentally believe that the government may have had noble intentions when BE was first established. It's Let's not say that they, they were trying to do the worst for South Africa, although there have been terrible consequences. But when a policy doesn't achieve what you want it to achieve, you stop doing it. You don't continue implementing that policy. And that's why I can't understand why government continues to, to cling to this failed policy when we believe there's so many other things. Our economic uh, justice policy is available on our website, and I encourage everyone to read that economic justice policy. It sets up very clearly what the DA's views are on how we can empower people by focusing more on the opportunity side of the economy. For the last 25 years, government has focused on the outcome of, the, of policies and the outcome uh, at the end. We believe you by focusing on the opportunity side of the economy, a decent education for everybody, jobs so that people are empowered, a good chance to get into tertiary education, getting onto the jobs ladder, getting onto the housing ladder, though, uh, early childhood development, all of those are uh, the opportunity side of the economy. Focus there and you have less inequality to, mad to manage on the other side of the equation. Uh, and then you, it allows you to focus a lot more. Um, I believe that there's a fundamental way for us to uplift black South Africans who are poor out of poverty, but it's not going to happen if we continue with this insider-outsider mm. stitch up between politicians and the connected few. Mm. Talking about our policies, John, they're so easy to understand. You can find them on the DA website, and I bet you more times than not you're going to agree with the plans and solutions that the DA is yeah. putting forward. But, John, on to the next one. Mm. Chris XDBS is worried about water security, and they ask, how will you bring about this vital change? Sure. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think it's a good, good, a good question and one that is very, very relevant. I've just come back from KwaZulu-Natal, uh, visiting places like Phoenix, Verulam, uh, the north of Durban, where communities have gone up to 84 days without water. Places like Ugu, down the south coast in KwaZulu-Natal, without water. And the same is repeated in Gauteng. Um, the reality is that in many instances, it's water infrastructure that's the problem. It's not a shortage of water. Uh, South Africa is becoming more arid and we do have challenges with climate change, but the big problem of why people are sitting without water mainly comes around infrastructure. And the reason for that is that government has neglected key infrastructure for over 30 years. These invisible services under the ground have remained un, uh, unfixed, uh, unrepaired, uh, maintenance has not been done. There's been a purging of qualified water engineers from municipalities. Uh, and it has led to a collapse in the infrastructure. That has now reached a tipping point. And it's going to require multi-billion rands investment now to fix it. So a number of things we would do is obviously find national funding to be able to fix water infrastructure, improve the ability of dams to be able to be used as storage facilities, um, look at things like water management, using uh, cap capturing water, um, looking at things like desalination, looking at things... Uh, that will allow people to use water more carefully. Uh, we're one of the few countries in the world where we flush toilets with clean drinking water. Just returned from India, where they had done some really incredible work on using grey water to re uh, recycle grey water to flush toilets, not clean drinking water. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to fundamentally change our relationship with water, but it's also going to require more investment in, in bulk infrastructure, 
and more investment in quality engineers who can then manage that infrastructure. And no municipal or public infrastructure should be put into the ground without a requisite operational budget allied to it to be able to make sure that it, uh, it is able to be maintained over its lifetime and that it is replaced, repaired, upgraded far before its end of life occurs as we're seeing in many parts of the country now. Mm -hmm. John, next one, jtaylor.95 says, what will you do to decrease crime and allow citizens to be better protected from it? Well, I've already spoken significantly around how we fix the uh, SAPS through devolution. I think that having a national police plan and trying to nail it into different provinces doesn't work. Uh, by way of example, I mean, the Western Cape has a problem with Perlman poaching, and that Perlman poaching is intrinsically linked to the drug trafficking trade, and it's intrinsically linked to the legal firearms uh, that, that circulate. And so you have to have a specific plan to do that. I don't know about any national plan to deal with Perlman poaching, which is why the province has had to step in now. So I think by localizing policing and giving more powers to metro police and provincial policing and giving provinces more power over how resources are deployed, we'll see a far better impact. But we also then have to bring the police service into the modern era. When you travel to other countries, um, I was in Taiwan a few years back, and you get into a police vehicle in Taiwan, um, I was in the front, not the back, just so you know. Um, <laughs> when you get into a police vehicle in Taiwan, um, it looks like the Starship Enterprise inside. It's got fingerprint recognition. It's connected to the home affairs system. It's able to be connected to CCTV cameras all around. Uh, it's just high tech. When you get into a South African police service van, if it's not been for six months sitting in the government garage and doesn't have a broken clutch, the most high tech piece of equipment is the CB radio. And you're lucky if it's working. And we need to really be able to equip and train our police service to be able to combat crime in the modern era. Technology is also moving rapidly. There's no reason why we shouldn't be deploying drone technology in rural areas to combat things like stock theft, to be able to combat uh, rural safety problems. So when stock goes missing, you get a drone up in the air. You could use drones to patrol large areas and then deploy resources when you find a problem. Uh, which eliminates the need for as many boots on the ground. There's all these innovative solutions, and they're contained in our policy, um, and I encourage people to look at it, because you're right. A lot of people say, to, oh, well, you know, all the DA does is criticize. They never put on the table solutions. Uh, that's not true, and we've got a solution for every major problem mm -hmm. facing the country. You only need to go to our website, www.da.org.za, and you can find the policies there. We're launching our manifesto on the 17th of February in Chwane. Um, have a look at our manifesto as well. It sets out very clearly our plan. We don't just criticize, although criticism is part of our job as the official opposition, but we're also a party of government and we're a party of solutions and we're committed to making South Africa work. And uh, we're very proud of what we've put on the table in the festival of ideas around how we save South Africa. John, I'm gonna challenge you. Mm. Okay, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, next question. Okay. Okay, ready? The time starts now. Grant Stretton says, how will you boost rural economies like farms and small towns? By stimulating local economies, by ensuring you have certainty in land uh, reform, so people invest in local rural economies by making sure that you uh, ensure that economic infrastructure and market linkages are available and that you have efficient and effective ports so that people can get their products to international markets and then to leverage our ability to trade in places like the US through AGOA and through our free trade agreement with the EU to better leverage that so that our rural areas can become thriving uh, economic hubs again and not the wastelands that many of them have become. Huh. Yes, you did it. <laughs> okay, next question. Brandon Ma. Based on the polls, how is the coalition pact looking for the election percentage-wise? Yeah, as I said, I mean, the, the multi-party charter party is around 36%, and obviously that's based on the last election. I think many of those parties may have grown. I certainly think the DA is going to grow uh, in this next election, um, and I think that's, that's going to be good for the multi-party charter. As I said, that's 16% off the 50% majority. Just think about it. In the last election, I think the ANC got around 5.4 million votes. 
there's 27 million votes there in the, in, in the, in the bag for us to be able to get. Um, allow, allow those 27 million, let's say 10% of the 27 million, with what we have already, we're over the finish line. New government, done and dusted. You'll have uh, an honest, efficient, effective government in place, uh, hopefully after May. Um, but again, I keep saying this because I suppose you can't say it enough. Register mm -hmm. to vote because if you don't register and you don't come out and vote, the ANC are going to win again and in five years' time, I'm not sure what's going to be left. Yeah, check.da.org.za, check.da.org.za. John, literally, I wake up in the morning and, you and can it's do like, check.da.org.za. You can do it now while you're watching. Right now. Yeah. Just open a new tab on your, on your phone, on your laptop. Keep the it's audio speaking. on there. Yeah, please do. <laughs> John, Clint Abrams says, I hear that the DA only delivers for white people in Cape Town. Why is this the case? No, that's not true. And uh, it's certainly, again, you don't need the DA propaganda factory to disprove this. You only need to open the uh, general household to access to basic services, uh, ratings Africa, the Auditor General's office. All of these show very, very clearly that that is not the case. In fact, the biggest beneficiaries of... Um, of good, clean, accountable government are poor South Africans. When money is not being stolen, when it's being spent where it should be, poor South Africans benefit the most. Uh, people who don't have the opportunity to put solar panels up and rely on a government to combat load shedding, uh, good, decent public hospitals, good public schools, a good pol a local policing to ensure that people are safe. 99.4% um, of households in the uh, city of Cape Town and Western Cape have access to piped water. Um, this is a huge statistic and far better than anywhere else in the country. 3.2 billion rand in the last Cape Town budget being spent on informal settlement upgrades and on previously disadvantaged areas. The Western Cape and the city of Cape Town's infrastructure budget this year uh, is bigger than Joburg's and Durban's put together. That is a commitment to providing good, stable services and sanitation to previously disadvantaged communities. Um, 100 million rand boost in the last year for road maintenance. And it shows in the results. Uh, you know, people have better access to jobs, better access to decent services. And again, it's not the DA propaganda machine. It's independent agencies that show that. Now, our colleagues like to, you know, uh, not colleagues, our people that sit across from us in Parliament, particularly ANC, it's like, like to say, oh, well, you can't compare... Kailich and Camps Bay. Of course you can't. Um, you know, you're dealing with a backlog and you want to be able to, to get there and there's a long way to go still. But equally so, you can't compare Kwamashu with Amshlanga uh, and you can't compare Alexandria with, with Soweto. Uh, we have a huge backlog uh, created by apartheid era spatial planning. But I can tell you now, the city of Cape Town is far more along in addressing those issues, making sure people have access to dignity and services, making sure that people have access to the things that they need to improve their lives than anywhere else in the country. And we hope that one day Kailicha will be up to the standard of Camps Bay, just as I hope that Kwamashu will be up to the standard of Amshlanga in KZN, and Alex will be up to the standard of Santon uh, in Gauteng. That is where we need to be heading. And I'm very proud of the work the city of Cape Town does. 72% of its budget spent on, uh, on improving life for poorer uh, Cape Townians. And I think that that is a record to be proud of. Of course, you can always do more. Of course, we want to do more. But there are budget constraints. The more money we get in, the more money spent on the people and on these projects, and the less money stolen at a national level, I think we'll be able to massively increase um, housing rollout, service rollout at a national level, and I think that will make all the difference. John, we could chat all evening and go for I hours. I thought we were. Right? Maybe we need to keep having these <laughs> so we can get through all the questions. Did Ed send his question in yet? Excuse me? Has Ed sent his Ed question? Ed hasn't sent his question yet, John. Mm. Ed, on, Ed. we, we, we want to wrap up. We've got a couple of questions to go. Where is your question? We are waiting for it. Uh, John Hope Nobubele says, what will change if you become the president of South Africa? Um, well, I think you'd have uh, honest government from the start um, and a government that's going to be on your side. And I think that's what South Africa has not had for a long time. I think for far too long, we've had presidents who've uh, put their parties before the country. 
um, President Zuma, President Ramaphosa, all put their loyalty to the ANC before their job of serving the people of the country. I can promise the people of South Africa good, clean, honest government, straight talk, and an inability to duck away from, uh, from the hard questions. And uh, a government that's going to work from day one on creating a legislative agenda that will ensure that your life gets better. I am absolutely committed to making sure that the 32 million South Africans who are largely, uh, who are trapped in poverty and who are largely black South Africans have somebody on their side for a change. And I promise to be a president that's on your side, fighting for you every day to make sure that your money is spent on ensuring that you and your family have a better life and that it's not snaffled away and spent on politicians. I promise to sell the presidential jet. I promise to sell the housing estates. I promise to make sure that your money is spent on you and not on the politicians. John, and he said, says, the DA sees itself as a leader. Can the DA be trusted to stay committed in a multi-party coalition agreement? Please give your reason. Yes, of course. And, and the DA uh, is involved in over 25 coalitions around the country. They bring good, clean, accountable and stable government to places as diverse as Richards Bay in KwaZulu-Natal and Saldana Bay in the Western Cape. We work well with our coalition partners where we share values and principles and a program of action. But here's the thing, for any coalition to succeed, it needs a strong anchor. The reason Joburg can't get its act together, the reason many other coalitions fail, you don't have a strong anchor. I believe the DA, as the second largest party in the country, can be a strong anchor. We can bring our experience in government. We can bring policies and, and tried and tested approaches to the table and be a core of a new majority in South Africa. Not doing so in a disrespectful way to other partners, but making sure that the coalition lasts and goes the distance and it doesn't fall apart. The more you spin to the vote, like was done in Joburg, the more you, uh, difficult you make it to put together a solid coalition that's gonna last five years and change your life for the better. John, some guy on YouTube not Ed. <laughs> no, literally, it's named some guy. Okay. <laughs> some guy on YouTube says, when will John learn Isi Zulu or Isi Kosa like Helen Zilla? Mm. He then says, I can help teach him for free. Oh, great. Well, let's get some guy's, uh, let's get some guy's uh, uh, details and uh, he, can, uh, he can teach me to, to speak Zulu. I, I do speak a little bit of it, um, not a lot, um, but uh, I'm very happy to learn. Um, I love languages, I love speaking to people, and uh, I'm always committed to learning new things. So, Gabonga Gakulu. Yeah, so just jump into John's DMs, some guy, uh, so we can get those free lessons. Yeah. Uh, John, next one, Sipo Mabasana says, What's your opinion of the DA being compared to the ANC? Well, there's no comparison at all. I mean, it's a terrible comparison. Agreed. It's like comparing you know, apples with. With, uh, with, with rotten sushi. <laughs> uh, they're two completely different creatures. I mean, the DA has a track record of delivery of good, clean, accountable government, a provincial government where every single department has a clean audit, where jobs are being created, where crime is being fought, where load shedding is being diminished, where um, cities and, and towns are working for their residents. And on the other hand, you've got this rotten organization so obsessed about it's infighting between itself and its former president, uh, fighting over the spoils, uh, fighting over you know, all sorts of things to worry about the people. Uh, they are a party that's of the past. We're a party of the future and we're progressive. We're excited about what the country offers. The ANC are regressive. Mm -hmm. They've got no new ideas. They've got the same old people that got us into the mess sitting around the table. If we want to change that, let's put some new people around the table. And I'm putting my hand up and the DA is too. John, we've come to the end of the questions from the public. But as the anchor, I'm going to take a little bit of advantage and ask my question. This is going to be a John. tough one, I bet you. No, 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 not so tough. John, being the leader of the DA must be really, really difficult. We, you know, you go through so much, uh, lots of fake news coming your way, a lot of abuse that you take. Um, why? Why do you do this job? 
Well, I do this job because I'm passionate about our country. I love South Africa. I think we have got the most amazing country. I think we've got all the resources. I think we've got the most amazing people in the world. Um, I think we've got uh, resilient com uh, communities who, who just want to see the best for themselves and their, and their, and their families. I'm with them. I I'm with the people at home who just want to make a better life for themselves and who know that this little piece of earth at the end of the great continent of Africa is a wonderful place and it's worth the fighting for and that's what gets me out of bed every day. Yeah. Last words for our viewers at home. I've only got one thing to say and that is thank you for watching. Please make sure you're registered. Check.da.org.za. The power lies with the registered and you can be the hero in rescuing South Africa by making sure you're registered and making sure you come out to vote on election day. And we're definitely watching Bafana Bafana yes. this evening. Maybe we'll win by one point. Like we seem to do well in the one point these days. And that should show you at home, every vote counts. We won the World Cup, Rugby World Cup, one point. Uh, Drikas won with one point. Maybe Bafana going to win with one point. And who knows, we may even win the election uh, later this year <laughs> can you with, one, with one point. So let's get excited about it. We can make it happen. John, can you imagine, literally, <laughs> if we win just with one vote? No, I'd, I, I'd, I'd prefer to have a bit of comfort. Uh, <laughs> 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 that would do too much on our hearts. <laughs> South Africa, there you have it. Straight talk with DA leader John Steenhuizen. Thank you, South Africa, for your questions. We hope you got the answers and clarity that you were looking for. Remember, this coming weekend is the final registration weekend and your last chance to register to vote. Visit your local IEC voter registration station on the 3rd and the 4th of February between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. or get help registering online at check .da.org.za or simply dial star 134 star 2004 hash. A new law states that you may only vote at your correct voting station in the upcoming election. I cannot stress this more. The time is now and we must not let this moment pass us by. Remember, if you are not registered, you simply cannot vote. Power to the registered. My name is Nazli Sharif, signing out, shop and away. In this election, only the registered have the power. If you're tired of load shedding, register to vote. If you're tired of corruption, register to vote. If you're tired of the rising cost of living, register to vote. And if you're tired of a government that's continuously working against you, register to vote. Go to check.da.org.za and let's give power to the registered. Thanks for watching. All across our beautiful country, people are joining forces to elect the new government that can rescue South Africa. Help our rescue mission and register to vote. Get help registering online now at check.da.org.za. Let's rescue South Africa.